the question of why these laws of nature rather than other laws of nature is more and more urgent because we don't discover any principle that completely constrains the laws of physics or explains why they are what they are. Um, and because, well, we don't have the complete set of laws and there's a great deal still to discover. Enough has been discovered um, that the focus shifts there. A, a, a key thing, at least for me, um, was that so far all the attempts to make a complete unification to merge particle physics with relativity and quantum mechanics with relativity um, do not constrain what the laws of physics are, particularly what the laws of particle physics are. Um, and this was a surprise. I think what many of us expected was that if we succeeded in unifying quantum theory with relativity and, and particle physics, there would be a unique way to do it, and that would lead to an explanation of why these laws coming from just mathematical consistency. And this doesn't seem to be the case. Um, none of the approaches to quantum gravity have that feature. Loop quantum gravity, when it succeeds, and it succeeds in completely, but in all the areas that it succeeds, could have all kinds of different matter quantum field theories in it. Um, and, and also string theory, to the extent that it succeeds, where it succeeds, seems to come in an infinite number of versions with different dimensions of space, different geometries of the internal dimensions, and hence different um, versions of particle physics. Um, and this was um, apparent, it was very clear already by 1987, 1988, um, in the development of string theory. Um, and so that's what pushed me to develop the view that there was a landscape of theories and there needed to be a dynamics through the past of evolution on the landscape and in which um, why this particular set of laws um, would be realized or would be probable to be realized. And that's why I developed the idea of cosmological natural selection. Now, there's a larger argument you can frame that in, um, which, which there's some philosophical precedence. Um, the, the American pragmatist, um, really the inventor of, of, of American, the tradition of American pragmatist philosophy, Charles Sanders Peirce, um, was very concerned with this issue. Um, and he said, and I quote him a lot, so maybe I can quote him almost not quite word for word, but he said that um, it, it's not sufficient to explain things by, by referencing a law of nature. Um, law, more than anything else, requires explanation why these laws hold and rather other, why other laws do not hold. Itself requires explanation and is the most paramount thing that requires explanation, why these laws. And then he says that the only way that laws can be explained is if they're the result of a process of evolution. Um, and he clearly was, he doesn't say so, but he clearly was referring to evolution via natural selection. He was very influenced by Darwin. And, and this was already in the 1890s that he understood that clearly. And, and if you like, that's... I had, in a particular context, a, a version of that insight that by appealing to a mechanism analogous to natural selection, you can have a historical explanation for why these laws that was actually predictive. Um, in an even broader context, um, Leibniz um, sort of set the highest standard for, for physics and cosmology, which is the principle of sufficient reason, that, that for every question about nature by which you could ask why was why is the world this way rather than otherwise? The answer shouldn't be arbitrary. The answer, there must be an answer by which there is a sufficient reason why the world is this way rather than that way. Um, so if we're to have a science that fully realizes um, the demand of, of the principle of sufficient reason of Leibniz, we must have an explanation of why these laws and why these initial conditions, and if it's not going to come 
from logical or mathematical consistency, which it seems like on present knowledge it can't, um, then um, then the only option is 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 what is a process of evolution, in which the explanation becomes historical. Standard framework for laws of physics. Um, comes out of a methodology which was developed to apply to subsystems of the universe, um, in which if you study a subsystem, you have control over the initial conditions and the boundary conditions, and you can set up an experiment over and over again and vary the initial conditions and vary the boundary conditions and separate out the influence of changing the initial conditions um, from what's invariant over the initial changing the initial conditions, which is the laws. The laws are the the generalities or the correlations that are invariant under changing the initial conditions. And much of the success of physics is due to the power of this method and the fact that the laws are to a large extent local. So you can, to some extent, treat open systems as if they were isolated systems, ignore the effect of things coming across the boundary of an isolated system and, um, and apply this methodology. It's always an approximation, but nonetheless, it's, it's a uniquely powerful approximation. Um, and, um, and then you come to cosmology, and it's very tempting because of its success to apply the same methodology but the operational conditions that make it meaningful and connected to experimental physics are no longer there because you no longer have many instances of the system, you no longer can control initial conditions. Um, and so there's a kind of fallacy that we call the cosmological fallacy that comes from trying to extend this methodology to cosmology. Um, and it leads to situations in which you can't answer questions like why these initial conditions, why these laws. And to escape from this, there's sort of two directions. One of them is to go outward, um, to posit that our universe is one of a plurality of universes. And hence, our universe is a small subsystem of some larger multiverse. And hence, to invent a larger universe that our universe is a subsystem of, so that the methodology which is appropriate for subsystems of a larger universe is appropriate. And this leads in the direction of the multiverse. The only, pro I mean, the only problem is that you, you have no observational control over the distribution of probabilities of properties in the multiverse, so you, can, you have a great deal of difficulty making any actual predictions about our universe. And if you don't do that, if you don't go outward to plurality, you have to go backward to a succession of stages of the universe. And as far as we can tell, this, this, those are the only alternatives. Either you go outward um, in, in some imaginary ensemble, or you go backward in time. And, um, and our view is that of those two options, it's only by going backward in time and evoking history and the possibility that laws evolve that you can address the issues of why these laws and why these initial conditions um, scientifically, that is in a way that leads to real predictions.